Welcome back, Pet Parent. Today's episode is serious, like very, very serious, but also, you know me, I can't be serious all the time, but I have some really interesting statistics. I think we all know that today, I'm rec we're recording this in October, 2024. Whenever you're hearing this, the statistics are for now. Right now, one in four dogs will develop cancer at some point in their lifetime. And nearly half of all dogs that reach the age of 10 are likely to be diagnosed with some form of cancer. And it's only getting worse. It's sad. But the, also the reality is that we all have the potential for cancerous cells in our body all the time. Our cells are constantly creating new cells and dying off. Like it's a very natural process in the body. So a cancer cell is just an abnormal cell. It divides uncontrollably. It just doesn't do all of the normal things that a normal cell will do, including that cell death that I was just talking about, which in scientific terms is called apoptosis. If you've ever heard that word before, um, cancer cells avoid this natural death process that our cells go through. Um, I don't know how many times we hear all these different statistics online, like every seven years, you're a completely new person because every cell in your body has changed. But cancer cells don't do that. They stick around. They, they are abnormal. And there are lots of reasons why um, these cancer cells may not be detected by the immune system. The immune system is suppressed, whether that is from some other form of sickness, you know, poor metabolic function, um, immune suppressing drugs, lots of different things could be going on. And when cancer cells have this opportunity to just continue to reproduce, which is what they do, they just keep, keep, um, splitting and creating new cells uncontrollably, the immune system isn't keeping that in check, that's when we have problems. These are also cells that like to migrate around the body. So even though I actually have um, a friend, he is 90 years old, he's had cancer twice, and what's really interesting is that he had breast cancer like, I don't, I want to say like 30 years ago, he had breast cancer, and they're still finding breast cancer cells in his body, but in other places in his body. It's really, really wild. And so today's guest is someone who has done research, unlike anyone else, who has created a test. It is both an in, you could get this done like in office or you can do this at home. And it has a, is it, is it correct that it's a 90% um, correct rate of being able to tell if a dog has cancer or potential some sort of potential for cancer so chan namgong he created oncotect is the test and i want to welcome chan onto the pet parenting reset thank you so much for being here with us hey thanks for having me jessica i really appreciate it yeah i'm really excited to talk to you about this because i have to be honest that when i first talked to you and you sent me a test I was like, Psh, no big deal. I'm good. My dog's healthy. And then I sent the test in and the email came into my, my inbox and it said, your test results are ready. And I was like, oh, I don't want to open this. <laughs> and it was fine. Like she, she was fine. It said that there's no alarm, no cause for alarm for my particular dog, but she is, she's going to be 11 this year, or sh this month, actually, she's going to be 11. And, um, I mean, I think she's pretty healthy, but I also, she was two and a half when I adopted her and she's eaten the absolute best foods the entire time I've had her, but I don't know what happened that first, like two and a half years of life. Um, there's obviously genetic factors. So can you tell me just a little bit about you, about the research that you did and creating Oncotect and exactly what it is and how it works? Yeah, of course. Um, well, again, thanks for having me to share my story and Uncle Tech's story uh, with your audience. Um, so Uncle Tech is, is a proactive cancer screening test for dogs. Uh, like you said, um, preventing cancer in, in dogs or even humans is, is, is very difficult, almost impossible. We know certain factors that can cause cancer, but we don't know, any, we don't know all about it. So really your best strategy is to find it early and treat it quickly. And that's what we do in human medicine. 
right? At certain age, you do cancer screening tests, um, and and if should you have any um, risk factors, then you do further diagnostic tests, and from there you do you know. And if you find cancer, cancer is treatable. You know, many people don't know that cancer is absolutely treatable. And what we have done is, uh, what we have discovered is. It is scientifically tr proven that cancer cells produce a very particular smell that's different from normal cells produce. So uh, I'm sure you've heard that, you know, how dogs are able to detect cancer in human medicine through smelling mm -hmm. it. And that's because cancer cells produce um, a particular smell and they can be trained to um, respond differently to, you know, um, to the patients that have, you know, cancer cells, a, a higher, you know, amount of cancer cells and patients they don't. So what we are using is what we have discovered is there are these small nematodes called C. elegans, and they are known to have very high sense of olfactory receptors, and they are known to respond differently to urine samples that contain cancerous metabolites, cancerous uh, volatile organic compounds, and urine samples that don't. So we have developed a process and an and analysis where we can use these worms to um, uh, categorize dogs in three different categories, low, moderate, and high risk of cancer. So what we are measuring is the amount of cancer metabolites in dog's urine. And based on that, um, the measurement, uh, we can say, hey, this dog, your dog is at a low risk of cancer at present time. Uh, your dog is moderate risk or high risk of cancer. Our test is not a genetic test. It is a uh, it is a is a test that can tell you um, whether your dog is is prone to having cancer. It's not that. It's like hey, your dog is is at risk of cancer or not at risk of cancer. Um, so I started this company back in 2019. It's been about almost five years. Uh, we've been, done a lot of research and development. We have a pen pending on our process on our technology. Uh, we are based in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, we work closely with North Carolina State University Veterinary School, but we are not affiliated with NC State, but uh, our lab is uh, located near NC State. And, you know, we introduced our first commercial product about two years ago, and we only worked with local hospitals at the beginning. Uh, but last October anniversary, this is actually, this month is our actually first year anniversary. We launched uh, a kit that, that, that you used last October. So now we are able to work with um, hospitals across the country, as well as consumers, uh, pet owners directly uh, through our website. Wow. So tell me again, so these are worm, worms, but they're like tiny little things that we can't see, right? No, they're microscopic nematodes. Um, and, okay. and C. elegans is, believe it or not, is very widely used in the world of science and biology. It is actually the very first uh, genetic, um, has gone through the DNA sequencing. So we know everything about these worms. And, and it's used in um, pharmacology, uh, oncology, um, biology. I mean, it's, it's used, widely used in, in the world of biology. We are using these worms for different application. Uh, they're known to have a very high sense of smell, olfactory receptors. Um, and and they uh, what we have discovered is that they respond differently to urine samples that contain higher amount of cancer metabolites than urine samples that don't. How how do they normally act and how do they respond differently? <laughs> well, sure. Um, so when we when we run these analysis on agar plates, they actually are attracted to urine samples that contain cancer metabolites. So they literally migrate towards urine samples. Uh, so we run uh, these very sensitive assays where we run six replicates because we want to make sure that each result is repeatable and replicable. And we get a mean average and we actually, there's a specific uh, calculation you do to, um, to determine their preference. Hey, are, are these worms actually preferred to move towards urine samples or are they not? And based on that, the mean average of that uh, chemo Texas value, uh, we have our uh, proprietary index where, uh, based on the value, we can categorize dogs as low, moderate, and high risk. Uh, and we've done this test uh, analysis, and we actually got a, a paper published in a peer-reviewed journal for veterinary science. Wow. So I was very, very pleased when I did finally open the email, and it said, sure. 
low and I was like, like I can breathe again I was surprised honestly because like I said I sent it off and I'm like Psh, no big deal sure she's got this no no worries but then the email came and I was like oh my gosh this is I was not expecting to feel like this so and that is actually one of the reasons why at first I was like oh my gosh I don't even know like, what is the application for a test like this? Because sure. you convinced me, obviously, but, um, and I want you to, to, to talk about that. But at first I, you know, being somebody that works one-on-one -on -one with, with pet parents, I'm like, I don't want to like stoke the flames. I don't want to start throwing around the C word when it's not necessary. I don't want to like freak people out and be like, oh my gosh, this lady thinks my dog has can't like, I don't, I don't want to say that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But at the same time, there are certain breeds of dogs that are more predisposed to cancer. There are, um, you know, I can I can think of a number of ways. One in particular is that on on the holistic side of what we do, if if a dog or a cat has some sort of lump or growth on them, I and some other people that do what I do would prefer to actually not aspirate because. Sure. There is also evidence that just poking a needle in something is going to agitate whatever is going on. And if it is cancerous, then it could potentially spread. cause it to spread. So I could see in cases like that where, okay, let's do this test and find out without having to do the aspirate, without having to agitate, you know, those cells and, and what's going on inside of the body. But for you, like, what are the primary applications? Sure. No, um, absolutely. So let me kind of step back and then I'll, I'll kind of explain uh, the research you've done first. Uh, so we've uh, primarily studied the four most common treatable canine cancers. So lymphoma, melanoma, hemangiosarcoma, sarcoma, mast cell tumors. And our accuracy was, uh, it's, 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 you said 90%, which is, uh, which is true, but to be more specific, it's 83% sensitivity, which is true positive and 96% specificity, which is true negative. So mm -hmm. no test is perfect. Even yeah, you know, ultrasounds, sure. x-rays can you know, miss cancer diagnosis. So no test is perfect. But as far as I know, our test is, is the best in class as far as accuracy goes. So we are very proud of what we've done. Um, so among those four common, you know, most treatable canine cancers, those, thing, those four cancers are absolutely treatable. Right? If you find early enough, you can treat these cancers. And that's really the, the purpose of you know, early screening, right? If you find it early enough, then you can treat it. We, how many times have you heard that, you know, I found out my dog was can diagnosed cancer and I have to, you know, put my dog down on the same yeah. day or next day or even within a week, right? The, the reason cancer is the leading cause of death in dogs is because of most often too late diagnosis. We just find out too late. And the things that we do to find whether our dog has cancer or not is through, you know, diagnostic tests, right? X-rays, ultrasounds, or biopsies, but they're invasive and they're expensive. It's not something that you can do every year or every six months. Let's say if you have a, you know, high risk dog breeds that you, you just can't afford to spend, you know, five, $600 every six months or every year just for these diagnostic tests. That's why we created this, you know, non-invasive cancer screening test. So it can be more proactive and preventative. We've done thousands of these tests with you know consumers directly, but with hospitals. And and we have three types of dog owners that we help. The first is people that want to go above and beyond anything, everything they can do to keep their dog healthy and safe, including cancer treatment. The second type is people that may not necessarily want to put their dogs through cancer treatment because of age, invasiveness, or cost. But they still want to find out because there are things they can do to provide better quality of life through supplements, mushrooms, CBD oils, palliative cares, or just giving them more favorite treats. And this is actually where uh, holistic vets have more options uh, for this category. They have there are more options to manage or treat cancer. And the third type is really the majority of our customers, which I think you also belong in this category, is that they just want to get peace of mind because so many dog owners have lost their dog to cancer before in a sudden devastating way that they weren't mentally or emotionally prepared for it. And they definitely don't want to repeat that experience. Um, so they want to be more proactive and more, more preventative in their dog's health. Um, so I know it can be nerve breaking to find out whether your dog has cancer or not, but it is in what we have found is people rather know earlier 
then too mm-hmm. late and then have regrets of what I could have done or should have done. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that because I was actually just getting ready to um, record a reel for Instagram and TikTok on just that topic because I had a cat who recently passed away very, very quickly on set, like within a few months of like, he had blood work done, everything looked good. And within a few months, he fractured his leg and I got it x-rayed and it was osteosarcoma. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, this happened so quickly. And one of the things that I was thinking about is that, okay, we know, we can, we can know that there is a higher probability of cancer with a test like this, non-invasive, as you were saying, much less expensive than a lot of those very invasive tests. And we can then make the decision to say, you know what, I know what it is now. Sure. Okay, let's do treatment or I know what it is now. So I'm going to continue monitoring the symptoms. I'm going to make adjustments in their food and their supplements, and I'm going to monitor their quality of life. And that's my goal. And so when we know we can kind of adjust those goal goalposts that we have. Well, knowing it is your first mm-hmm. battle, right? You got to know first before you can do anything. So, you know, mm-hmm. it's always, you know, the screening, diagnosis, and treatment. It's, we just hear, you know, diagnosing a cancer is like a putting a puzzle together. There's no one test that can tell you uh, everything. You got to bring different pieces of information from different tests and different, you know, you got to kind of look at it at a holistic you know, holistic view. Uh, and, you know, these diagnostic tests can miss it. Even, you know, we've heard many vets sometimes miss it. Um, I mean, our test, again, is not perfect either, but you got to bring different pieces of information together to look at a kind of big picture. And and that's why I think proactive screening is so important um, because you don't want to put yourself behind the eight ball where you just, you know, by the time you find out, like you just have, you, you, you don't have any options to do anything. Um, so that's where uh, our, our test comes in. Yeah. And that is so true. What you said earlier that oftentimes by, by the time we as pet parents find out it is so late in the game mm-hmm. that, yeah, there probably are some things we still could do, sure. but for me, at least, I am going to take the animal's quality of life into consideration sure. first and foremost above anything else. And that's something that I personally have learned with age. Like I mm-hmm. have had so many pets over my lifetime at this point, and um, I just lost my cat, Romeo. He was the eighth cat that, I, or the eighth pet that I've lost. And so having been through this so many times, not all of them were cancer, but having been through this so many times, I I can definitely say like earlier on in my life, I was just like, I want to do any and everything, whatever is available, let's do it. Like I don't, you know, go into debt. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. And now I am, I'm still that I still have that mindset of like, I don't, care what it costs. They're my family, but I am putting their quality of life over and above everything else. And I think this kind of test and not, obviously we want to be able to know ahead of time and be proactive and and know as quickly as possible, Mm -hmm. um, that there are concentrated amounts of these, what did you call them? Cancer metabolites. (laughs) Yeah. Cancerous metabolites. Because we can get on top of it, but it can also give us peace of mind when it comes back and it says low. Sure. I mean, if you, like you said, if you want to have options, you have to know first, right? Because if you don't know, you're not going to have any options later. Yeah. So these are, these tests are available. Like there are some veterinarians that are already using these tests and it's also available directly to pet parents, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. So we work with over, uh, our test is available at over 150 veterinary hospitals uh, in the country, and we are adding more every week. Um, it just, add, you know, we, we like to onboard one veterinarian, uh, like one at a time, personally. So I make all the personal, personal presentation to them, and I onboard them personally, because I think it's important that they understand what it is that they're offering. But also we, because of our test is only available at 150 vet hospitals, 
um, we wanted to make it available to anyone to purchase it online. And then the urine collection process is, is surprisingly not as difficult when you have the right tools. And that's what we provide. Uh, we provide, you know, just small little tools that you, you need to collect small amount of urine sample at home. And surprisingly, you know, we actually rarely get rarely get any complaints or any, um, you know, questions about, hey, I can't collect urine sample because it's, you know, if right tools, it's not too difficult. And all we need is very small amount. And then they mail it in. And um, as part of their activation process, we ask all pet owners to put in their veterinarian information so that we can auto share that information with their veterinarian. Like we are on the same page. We want the, we want to work with veterinarians and we want everyone um, kind of the care team be on the same page. Um, mm -hmm. So we auto share the reports and if they have any questions, they can always come to us for any you know questions or recommendations. But our our report is uh, very well structured, and uh, I, I'm sure you've seen it. It you know, shows you know what the next step should be, what the suggest you know you know suggestions are based on you know the mod low, moderate, and high risk. Um, and you know we work really well with veterinarians. Uh, we initially we thought that we were gonna get a lot of pushback from veterinarians, but you know. I, Believe it or not, they actually really uh, like the fact that you know, we're able to do this uh, um, on their behalf, and they uh, really appreciate what, we, what the work we are doing. Well, and yeah, I can imagine that. Um, well, first of all, we know that you know veterinarians go into this field because they love animals, and sure, absolutely, the quicker, the sooner that they know that their patient mm -hmm. could potentially have a cancer diagnosis. Um, the easier their job is. That's right. And it is non-invasive, which is the best possible outcome mm -hmm. <laughs> for the pet. Uh, you know, normal, um, so like blood panel or like urine, urine analysis that, you know, they do, um, you know, every, you know, six months or 12 months, those tests are great at picking, you know, you know, the typical disease or typical health issues, but they're not designed to pick up cancer. Um, yeah. So uh, that's why we miss cancer diagnosis all the time, even if we do blood work or ur analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so, we, so you need a specific test that's designed to pick up these different biomarkers um, mm -hmm. that that cause cancer or that are, you know, the the risk of cancer. So that's what we what we design, and and this our test is is complement to what they already are doing. It's not, you know, not replacing what they're doing. It's a complement to what they're doing. And it can only help them, you know, get ahead of, um, you know, the risk that they may face potentially. Uh, and and we want to, our goal is to, at the end of the day, our goal is to bring these dogs back to veterinarians so they can, you know, really do, um, provide, you know, uh, more for their diagnostic tests or consultations. And, and we always say our test is a, is a proactive screening test, not a confirmatory diagnostic test. And our results uh, must be confirmed and, uh, and consulted with veterinarian. Well, yeah, that makes sense. But still, I, th I think that peace of mind. And I, I think <laughs> I like I only think that really because I got that email and I was like, oh, no. And then I saw low and I'm like, oh, like, I feel like I can breathe now. But so this is just for dogs, right? It's not, this it doesn't work the same dogs, for cats. No, right now, but we do have a plan to uh, start developing a test for cats next. Um, you know, it's, it, theoretically, it should work for cats, but, you know, their urine collection process is a little bit different than dogs, yeah. especially yeah. doing it at home. So that's something that we have to logistically um, figure it out. Uh, but it's only for dogs right now. Yeah, the um, I, I definitely have, I've had some cats that I can literally just like, take like a little ramekin and go right up underneath of them and they're fine. And other cats yeah. would just like run out of the litter box if I did that. Yeah. And I have, this is absolutely uh, no way sponsored, um, but there is a um, hydrophobic litter out there that mm -hmm. you might want to look at. Okay, yeah. Partnering with them. Sure. <laughs> because the reality is that um, cats cats get veterinary care far less than dogs do. That's right. Yeah, it's it's a, such a hassle, a stress for owners and the and the and yeah. It is. And I have never been that person. I'm going to be completely honest. I have, I would probably be like a millionaire right now if I didn't have pets in my life because <laughs> my, I believe me, I've, I have 
given it all to veterinary in my lifetime um, with the number of animals that I have had. But um, yeah, I feel like this could be almost even more beneficial for cat parents sure. because they don't get their cats into the veterinarian's office as frequently as, and cats are just as susceptible. Yeah. And honestly, I'm just thinking these things through as I'm talking to you. I have had multiple cats now that were diagnosed with IBD, which is not really a diagnosis, but that's what veterinarians diagnose, you know, uh, Western med di veterinarians diagnose. And I have done multiple podcasts on this with like the two crazy cat ladies and um, talking about my experience. They oftentimes with cats will not test further and say, okay, it's, it's IBD. We think it's IBD, but also it could be small bowel lymphoma, but we're going to treat it the same. So why go through the extra diagnostics, blah, blah, blah. And this could be like really, really beneficial. Yeah. No, we, were... we definitely think that, um, we should have a test for cats and we get a lot of, you know, people asking about it. So we are definitely thinking about developing a test for cats for sure. Yeah. Um, so why did you develop this test? How did you figure this out? And like, do you have, did you have a dog with can? How did this happen? Yeah. So, uh, no, I didn't have a dog with a cancer, but I, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer about seven, mm. seven, eight years ago. She's healthy now. She's fine. Oh, she's doing great. Good. But during that process, I had an opportunity to read a lot of cancer related journals and, you know, papers. And that's when I came across this science. Um, or discovery where these small nematodes can um, detect cancer in human medicine first. So, you know, uh, as I was doing more research, I couldn't believe this is back in 2019. And I couldn't believe that cancer was a leading cause of death in dogs, but there were, there weren't any screening tests available for dogs or cats or companion animals. Uh, and I thought that just, that thought that was just crazy. And, and, and I've heard how dogs were used to detect cancer in human medicine. But the reason why we don't use dogs to detect cancer in human medicine is because it's just not, um, it's not possible to scale that operation. Yeah. It's just extremely ex expensive to train dogs to carry out those tasks and uh, they can only do so many. So I thought maybe we can create a platform where we're using these worms to detect cancer in, in uh, veterinary medicine and we can scale this. Uh, and that's how I started the business. Well, I'm really glad that your mother is doing better. That's, yeah. it's so interesting, like the things that happen. I was sure. just um, talking to Emily Stein, who created teeth. Mm -hmm. It's a, a water additive for dental health. And it was her grandmother mm. who like, she had rheumatoid arthritis so bad she couldn't even brush her teeth. Sure. And it was, it's just amazing. Like, yeah. The paths we go down uh, because of the things that, that happen in our lives. Yeah. Well, so if somebody wanted to learn more about this, wanted to see, I actually, gosh, they're on your website. I thought I had it pulled up, but maybe I didn't. There is a, um, a graphic of the the dogs that like the dog breeds top dog breeds that sure. are like most predisposed yes. to cancer so if people are interested in finding out like is their dog on that list or you know they can oh here it is um i have it right here so oh and you have it listed out by those uh mast cell tumors bone That's cancer true lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, and melanoma, which melanoma which says all breeds, but so the other four, uh, mast cell, bone cancer, lymphoma, and hemangiosarcoma. And what I find is that um, there's so much <clears throat> misunderstanding with cancer and treatments for cancer and how <clears throat> it all works that like, that to me, that's another reason to be as proactive as possible, to stay on top of it and find out as quickly as possible. So you have the time to do the research because a lot of times we wind up in the veterinarian's office. Our dog is crashing. We're freaking out. We have anxiety. Our dog is like, you know, in bad shape. And our veterinarian is like, this is wrong. And this is wrong. And this is wrong. And here's the, you know, it's going to be $10,000 and we need to do this right now, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you don't, you don't have time to take a breath, much less research like, okay, this is the diagnosis. These are the symptoms that 
you know, my dog does have, these are the symptoms that they don't have. And what is that, you know, doing all of that okay. takes time. And uh, to be able to have that time to do the research, to not feel like you're in that position where you're being forced to like make this huge decision immediately while you're in this heightened state of anxiety like that right. is just like the worst to me yeah, don't don't make any important decisions when you're in <laughs> you know when you're you know in that you know state of mind right yeah yeah and we feel like we have to um especially if like our dog is crashing yeah. um so i get it like i empathize because i've been in similar not for cancer but for other i've been in similar situations and it's like you know, so to stay on top of things. So the more we know, the better we can do, the more That's preventative right. care we can give to our pets and ourselves. And um, so thing. There are, they're beginning to have more tests available um, like this uh, in human space, a blood test. Um, there, I know there's a uh, test called Grail that's available that's based on um the based on blood um that's that's available and there are a few other tests that are available but um um Cologar is is a mm -hmm. uh, has uh, based on using stool uh but for you know colon cancer uh, yeah. the grail is a test it's a multi-cancer detection uh, test in human space so these you know pre-screening proactive screening uh, multi-cancer detection is it is it is becoming uh more uh, i don't know it's really not popular, but becoming more available to yeah. in human space, but also in in uh, been there space as well. But That's we're, awesome. We're the only company that does uh, this test um, and make it available to pet owners directly because it is based on urine, uh, and then yeah. that's really uh, by design. You know, from the from the get go, we wanted to develop a test that can be available. You know, really make it available. Um, affordable, simple, convenient for, uh, for pet parents, um, as opposed to you having to go to the, you know, vet and get the blood drawn and, you know, just kind of take that, you know, inconvenience out of the, out of, you know, the equation. Yeah. And the technology is just so fascinating to me. Yeah. So fascinating. So if a pet parent does want to know more, if they want to learn more about your company, about where, where can they find this information? Uh, all the information uh, they um, they want to learn is all on our website. Our papers, uh, published paper, is available on our website. Uh, everything that I've you know shared today is is all available on the website. Uh, of course, if they have any additional or specific questions, they can reach out to us uh, via email or our online chat. Uh, we are very responsive. Uh, we try to respond to uh, any requests or questions within you know twelve to twelve twenty four hours. So we are very responsive, um, and yeah, every, everything they want to learn uh, is is available on our website. That's awesome. So that will be linked in the show notes. But if you're just like driving and listening, it's oncotect o n c o t e c t dot c o is where you can get all of that information and then follow them on social media, which I think you have Facebook and Facebook, Instagram, um, everything. Perfect. All of the places, follow them on whichever platform that you hang out on. Instagram sure. is my favorite, as you guys know. Our website is really the best place to find all the detail information. Perfect. And you can order the test there as well. That's right. Awesome. Well, Chan, thank you so very much for your time, for doing this, for putting this together. That seems like so much research. And I'm <laughs> thank you. So many years in a lab, I'm sure. A lot of resources. It, and somebody's got to do it. So why not you? That's right. Thank you for that. Do you have any pets now? No, I I have three kids. I have three young kids. So, you know, we, we don't have the, the bandwidth or capacity to have pets right now. <laughs> gotcha. Well, at least you have a, a place in your heart for them. Yes, so. I did have dogs growing up, but not right now. <laughs> yeah, they're amazing. So, yeah. well, thank you for what you do. Guys, go check out Oncotect, O-N-C-O-T-E-C-T. -E and all of those links will be available on the... Uh, in the show notes on the website at thepetparentingreset.com. 
As always, if you have any follow-up questions, you can obviously reach out to Oncotech. You can also send me a DM on Instagram. I'd love to help you out. And yeah, with that, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you again and goodbye to our listeners if you have any parting words for them. Oh, no, uh, thank you for having me uh, sharing our story. And I look forward to you know speaking with you again and I'm sure seeing you in different you know conferences or shows and whatnot. But thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, guys, you have a great rest of your week and I will see you next week.